Hello, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network podcast. In case you're not familiar with us, the Sacred Inclusion Network is an emerging community whose mission is to explore the sacred in all of its dimensions. Formerly known as the Diversity and Spirituality Network, we're committed to exploring the integration of diversity and spirituality. Now, we all have different opinions as to what that looks like, but for me personally, I see the exploration of difference as nothing less than a sacred path in and of itself. I like to invite you to rate the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts, which goes a long way to helping us spread the word and to share our message of sacred inclusion. Today, I'm so excited and privileged to interview Sarah Minkara, who's a social entrepreneur and the founder of Empowerment Through Integration, or ETI, a nonprofit committed to developing a more inclusive society through both empowering youth with disabilities individually and transforming social cultural stigmas against disability globally. She's also a Muslim and Lebanese American woman who lost her sight at age seven and a visionary activist whose personal, personal pledge is to equip young people with disabilities with the confidence and skills to succeed. With support from the Clinton Foundation, she founded ETI while an undergraduate at Wellesley College and expanded ETI's programs and missions while earning her master's degree in public policy at Harvard, University, Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. She's also quite a powerhouse and a personal inspiration. She's one of these young people who makes an older man like myself ask himself the question, what have you been doing with your life? <laughs> Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm honored and excited and thrilled to be with you today. Well, thank you, Sarah. You know, I always ask people to, to give, give me a sense of your early religious or spiritual upbringing. What did that look like? So, yeah, so I grew up um, in a household that we, we practice Islam. You know, I'm Muslim. And, you know, even though we lived in a town, we grew up in a town where we were probably one of the only few Muslim families. So, but at home, it was a big part of our upbringing. Um, and Islam means, you know, sur surrendering and submitting to God's will. And, you know, it was very much embodied in all aspects. Um, you know, we did the five daily prayers. We fasted Ramadan. And there was this whole concept of, you know, um, God is loving. And you, whatever God puts in your path is, there's a blessing behind it. So trying to always explore that and figure that out but it, it you know so our islam and um was a big part of kind of how we approach our daily lives and we we used to go to saturday school saturday and sunday school tuesday quran classes you know it was very much part of our lives um in all aspects and we used to go to the mosque every week so um yeah, it was, and it was embraced in a way that was not forced, but oh, it was done in a way that was like, you know, see the beauty and see the the, the, the blessings behind it. So, Sarah, as you know, um, people in the United States, in particular, um, and maybe in the West in general, they have um, they have no idea what Islam is about. Mm. You know, they see people that are terrorists, for example, and they think that is Islam. And I don't think I'm exaggerating that much. I'm just trying to give get some sense as to how it helps shape you. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, so, so yeah. So, so Islam. I mean, Islam was a big part of our lives. I mean, as as we know, there are 1.8 billion individuals in this world who are Muslims, and it spans a vast kind of diversity of different cultures and people that embrace Islam. Um, and the way we embrace Islam here in, you know, in Hingham, Massachusetts, in the U.S., um, was very, was very beautiful. You know, our parents really um, brought the core elements and the values of what Islam was about. And Islam comes from this whole element of submitting and surrendering to kind of God's will. And really um, seeing every action and every step in our lives in that intent of really um, um seeing the beauty behind God's blessing. So mm -hmm. 
we grew up um we grew up doing the five daily prayers which for me was a huge aspect of keeping me grounded because life throws things at you and throws challenges at you and having those five daily prayers keeps you focus on you know there's a greater force there's god and that's you know taking care of us and um it's so important to keep that in mind right um fasting during ramadan um zakat giving zakat which is giving um um charity you know all these different things really kept us grounded and really helped us deal with whatever came our path and um and that was it was an embrace in a loving in a beautiful way it was embraced in a way that i i love god because i know god is the most loving god is the most merciful is the most empathetic and he knows what we're going through and he's not going to put us down a path that's not good for us and there's always a blessing behind it, it, in everything so I want to back up because because I'm uh, I'm a little bit ignorant of Islam. I know a little bit about it, but what are the five basic prayers? If you could just give me a very short version. The five prayer. So I'll I'll, to, I'll to answer two two things. So there's the five pillars of Islam, which are, um, you know, saying that I believe in God and there's only one God, and that um, Muhammad is the last prophet and his messenger and the last prophet. Um, two is f- praying five days, five times a day. Third is fasting, Ramadan. Fourth is paying zakat, so giving charity every year. Um, and fifth is doing pilgrimage in Mecca if you're able to, uh, once in your life. And it, that's if you're able to. And then within that, so f- praying five times a day. So uh, we pray five times a day. One is before sunrise, and that's um, Salat al-Fajr. So that's oh, so you meant the, the five... When you said five, there's five times, but there's all. You, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were saying there's five specific prayers. Did you also say that, or does something? So, so there's you? five pillars of Islam. I got and that. One right. of them is the five daily prayers. Okay. So every day we pray five times a day. That's what you mean. Just praying five times a day. Exactly. I got yes. it. Yes. All right. Now, um, the world knows you, Sarah, um, because you're a blind person. So I think it might be useful for, uh, and you're, you're obviously more than that. And I want to illustrate that this is this is Sarah's face in the in the world to a certain extent. And you have a mission that's based on that. But I think it would be useful to at least um, explain a, a little bit about the, your transition from from you didn't you didn't you grow up as, as a sighted not grow up but you were you were sighted from until you were age of seven and then you became blind. Maybe you could just tell us that story. Yeah. So was born sighted um and then at age seven years old actually on my birthday to be exact um wow. we, were, we were um in our summer house in L- lebanon um because we used to visit our extended family in lebanon every summer and it looked over these big beautiful mountains i remember waking up that day and um telling my mom that i can no longer see the mountains um so from what i want from one day that i could f- fully see to a day to the next day where most of my vision was gone. I, I At that time, I had 2% left vision, usable vision, which then was gradually de- decreasing over time until like in college, I had no more usable vision. Um, but yeah, it was a very much from one day to the other. And I remember my mom realizing that now her second daughter has also become blind because my sister two years previously also at age seven became blind. Um, and she, I remember she hugging me really tightly and, you know, saying, you know, Sada, everything is going to be okay. And everything, you know, everything was okay. I mean, to be honest, kids adjust. I feel like it's harder for the adults. Um, it's harder, probably, it was probably harder for my mom and my parents. Um, and we, I mean, we adjust as kids. We, we just, you know, and I think it's, I think because my, my parents really approach our disability from a very, I would I want to say from a technical lens, okay, they can't see. Okay, we understand there's the opposite of not seeing. Let's figure out how to make sure that they still get the full, um, full, full features of this life, and you know, go to school and you know. So that was my mom focused. She is gonna go to school, continue going to school, continue doing amazing things. We're not gonna say she can't do this because she cannot. She cannot see, and that was her focus. Wow. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you you and I talked privately before this, and uh, and I was just I was so impressed with your mother, and I wonder if you could share share a little bit about her and, and her influence on you. 
I mean, she, she is a strong woman. Um, she's a strong woman that really, you know, because she had, she had two options, right? She had one option of wallowing in her misery and really, you know, feeling bad for herself and her kids and, and feel bad and, you know, approach this pity narrative and approach, oh my God, our life is over and all that kind of stuff. And she, she, you know, and a lot of people do go down that path and, and I don't blame anyone that goes down that path because it's not easy, but she took the other path and the path of, um, you know, believing in God's will and saying, Mm -hmm. there is a purpose behind this. And, uh, um, and so my parents really had that. And it, to be honest, so our, our faith in God really is what helped us um, refocus ourselves and say, you know what, there's a purpose behind this. I don't know what it is. And yes, it's really tough right now, but you know what? I'm not going to listen to the outside world of what the world thinks about disability. I'm not going to listen to any of this. And I'm going to just focus at home and make sure our my kids go to school and live a very much quote unquote, I'm going to say normal life, but you know, a full life, right? Um, mm-hmm. An integrated life, a mainstream life. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think most people, when they see a blind person on the street, um, they don't have any idea. Um, you know, it's almost like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, it's hard to to think of yourself inhabiting that kind of world, you know? And um, you already talked about the sort of pity narrative that c- certain people have. Um, I wonder if you, what can you tell us about the, the, and you, and you've have interacted with probably a thousand blind people, you know, cause that's kind of what you, you, you do, um, or have done. Um, can you, can you tell us some things about uh, the experience of being, um, blind that, um, maybe most people would not have any idea understanding of? So I'll give you two, um, two stories. Um, one is I remember one time during, um, my work and my trips and, um, three TI in Lebanon, I met this kid, um, we entered his home and we saw him in the corner. He was still in diapers. He was 12 years old at the time. He's never been to school. His parents abandoned him when he was a kid. His grandparents are trying to figure out, how to, you know, to, to get rid of him, right. To find a way, you know, and this was all because he was born blind. And I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, I could have been in his shoes and he could have actually been in a different um, setting and really actualized his potential and value. Because I truly believe that every single person in this world has something to be able to contribute every single person. And it's just, it depends on the situation and the setting and everything. So imagine, imagine that in that kid's, um, uh, stories, one of millions of stories of kids who are, have a disability. I'll give you another example. I met a, um, a senator in Thailand who was blind. Amazing guy, impressive guy. And he, w- he told me that when he would go back to his village to where his family's from, um, he's told not to use his cane because so people don't identify him as blind. Um, because there's a strong stigma attached to the, to the white cane. And that stigma is everywhere across the world. And I've seen this everywhere. Wherever I travel, there is stigma attached to the white cane, right? Um, so wherever you travel, whether, I mean, even here in the U.S. is much more and more subtle. But wherever you travel, there's a sense of first instinct and the first assumption and the first narrative that comes to people's mind when they see a person with a disability is that, oh, they must be going, they must have a really hard life. They must be suffering. I feel bad for them. They're incapable. Um, you know, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it, yeah. So that's kind of. Um, okay. So I want to ask you a delicate question, um, Sarah, you know, and, and it sounds like coming from a, a, a cited privilege, I'll, I'll say, but, you know, I've had the experience of like um, going on like a trust walk you know, where you put a blindfold around your eyes. And um, my experience of going through processes like that, it's almost like my other senses were um, came to the fore. I was able to use my hearing. I was able to, uh, I recognize I had a sense of smell, all these kind of things. So I'm wondering if there if there are some sort of hidden gifts that um, uh, maybe you you and other blind people have have to rely on or or or, or have that uh, maybe most sighted people don't have. Yeah, I would say that the human body um, 
whether one is sighted or not has more capacity and more ability than we realize. And what ends up happening is when a person is then blind, the body is just tapping more into the other senses and more of that the capacity in those in those ways, right? So um, to give you an example, when a person is born blind, you know, automatically they um, they start um, um, they they start kind of uh, developing this echolocation ability, mm-hmm. you know, where they. You know, I don't. So echolocation is actually really fascinating. It's um, similar to how bats kind of navigate. Um, human bodies can actually navigate through echolocation through like different kind of techniques, and it's fascinating. And the reason why we don't see more of that is because because um, of society and kind of um, conforming to what is normal. Um, um, then people around them say, no, stop acting like that. Cause they don't know that's actually allowing for the kid to, to navigate more independently. So, but what I'm saying is that whether you or me, whoever, we have more in our capacity than we realize. Hmm. Um, so me as a blind person, because I can't see now I'm, I need to depend more on my hearing. I need to depend more on my sense of smell and touch. And, um, so I wouldn't say like we have more of uh, more powers on, on our other senses. We're just tapping more into them, if that makes sense. You know, this echolocation is a fascinating concept. I mean, you know, um, so are you saying when you when you mention that that this is a human capability that we have, but we don't recognize that we have it if we're sighted? Let's say. And, and and we don't. I mean, and I would. I mean, I, one of my one of my one of my dreams is to actually goals is to learn echolocation. Um, wow. You see, there's this amazing guy, um, blind individual that actually teaches echolocation, and he's able to ride a bike independently through oh just his echolocation. Um, he's able to. He just navigates without using a cane, all that kind. Because he can. He can. You know, sense around him through echolocation. But again, we don't see a lot of that because why? Because it. It looks not normal, right? It looks weird. It's, you know, how people are, are, because they have to do certain movements and certain noises and that kind of stuff. Well, if you're sighted, you don't need it, you know, um, as much. Um, yeah, but, but, it, but, but, but then, exactly. But then but what ends up, what the, the whole issue is blind people or people with disabilities are almost forced to conform or almost forced uh-huh. to fit in. You know, and there's that sense of trying to fit in and if not fitting in, you're further marginalized, right? So parents will end up telling their kids, no, don't don't behave in this way so you can look more normal. Um, no, look straight at me because, you know, a lot of blind people might not look straight, right? Or might act in a different way or the body language. No, look more normal. Um, don't use a white cane. In a lot of places across the globe, parents tell their kids, don't use a white cane because we don't want you to look, you know there's still this sense of, you know, fitting in or listening to the stigma. And that's why we always say the biggest obstacle for people with disabilities, the biggest disability for people with disabilities is society and the stigma Mm -hmm. around it. Because we're always trying to fight it or fit in. So, Sarah, um, I encourage everybody that's listening to this to go to the the ETI uh, website and I'll put the the link um, to it in the show notes. Um, I just think it's, you know, I've been to it and... um, uh, frankly, Sarah, I'm at all at the wit we you birthed. Um, it's a, it seems like an amazing organization. Um, you got ambassadors, you have uh, sponsors. It, it's like you've built this basically, probably yourself and with the help of others. Um, however, I don't know, since you were an undergraduate uh, at school, I mean, it's amazing. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about the the process of starting it from motivation to creation, where you see where you think it's going, just anything. Yeah, so I started it when I was in college, um, and it, 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 I, I don't, I don't want to say it was by accident, but I was never, that was never my intention to enter this field. I was a math and econ major. Um, I'm an introvert, um, so I had a plan of doing a PhD, you know, so all these different things, but um, when I was a sophomore in college, I kind of, we, uh, my friend and I, Mason Murad, we got a grant for, from the Clinton Foundation to run this in, uh, to be able to run an inclusive summer camp in Tripoli, Lebanon, where my parents are from originally. And it was bringing together kids with and without disability. And the purpose of this camp is to really show the beauty and the value of inclusion. And that camp turned out to be impactful, not only for the kids, not only for the parents in the community, but even for myself, because I realized that this is the first time almost I told 
myself in the world that I'm proud, you know, I'm blind and I'm proud to be blind, right? And um, so the impact really resonated with me. Um, and so a couple of years later, my thesis advisor is like, Sarah, why are you applying to these PhD programs? Go pursue um, what you've started because your eyes sparkle when you talk about that camp. So I ended up turning it into a nonprofit and it was a, through a lot of support of my friends. Like um, I, I wouldn't have been able to do what I've done so far. It wasn't for my friends and family. Um, for many years in the beginning, it was a lot of um, sweat and blood and volunteers and, you know, hours in the nights just to really get ETI up and running. Um, and then I realized that I needed to actually get more um, experience and more kind of skills. So that's why I ended up going to Kennedy School for my master's to kind of learn about how do I develop soft skills to really run an organization and how do I also think about developing programs that really address the disability inclusion from a systemic level. So, yeah. One of the things that really um, sort of attracts me to your to your website and to your organization, you have this program that's called Ambassadors, yes. and um, I wonder if you'd explain that, and and uh, you know maybe I'll ask you some questions about it. You know, I'm curious as to why people become an ambassador, what an ambassador does, and you know just the impact of of, of having ambassadors. Yeah, so we believe that disability inclusion cannot be just achieved through working with a disability community, right? Um, everyone needs to be involved in some way or form. And, and it is a value for everyone. We do believe that the inclusion of people with disability is a value for all. So for us, we're trying to really spread the word into different spaces and communities and networks and that are not thinking about disability. And the way we do that is through the ambassador program, right? We're always, we, we recruit ambassadors from different sectors, different backgrounds, different walks of life. They might not even be connected to disability and, you know, or have a, have a disability or have a family with a disability, right? But they see the value in it and they bring that narrative forward to their spaces. And that's what we're trying to do is really create a ripple effect of narrative change through the ambassador program. So you recruit people for this. It's not just people volunteer for it. You actually say, well, this person would be a good recruiter. Yes. This person would be a yes. good ambassador. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, definitely I mean, people knock on our door too. <laughs> yeah, right. We're always, yes, definitely. So, I mean, so what does a typical ambassador do? And I know there's probably no typical, but g- give me a sense as to what that person would do. Um, so it, it would be a wide range whether um, they actually um, host an event for ETI in their, whether it's in their company, in their network, um, they organize something or they introduce us to folks or they're um, spreading the word of disability inclusion through their social media. So it could be in so many different formats. Um, But our goal is to really um, have them feel like they're invested in the mission of disability inclusion and that they are um, bringing that forward in their own space. So possibly... um... In, in the fullness of time, um, maybe um, the ambassador and you could do a sort of an event for our Sacred Inclusion Network, for yeah, example. Exactly, exactly. So I know, Sarah, you've, you've, you've built like a lot of, um, you, you've built this organization pretty much from the ground up. And I also know you have some future aspirations. So, um, and you, you started your own business. And tell me a little bit about your future plans. And- yeah, so it's always been my plan um, to you know, when starting UTI and growing it to kind of ha- hand over my baby to the next leadership <laughs> and to the next, you know, because that's that's how an organization is going to survive and grow if it's sustainable beyond its founder. So uh, I'm, you know, moving to become a, a board member um, to keep, of course, um, still be in touch with the vision of UTI and help it and support it in any way it's needed. And now I'm starting a new company um, that is focusing on authentic inclusion, you know, you know, which is how do you create a space where you're able to embrace all of who you are and bring that forward and the person is able to, in front of you is able to do the same thing. And that for me is really also connected to, I'm personally connected to that because for me, it's been a journey to embrace my blindness, to embrace my, um, all of my identities and, you know, and continue learning more about myself and bring that forward and make sure I'm not ashamed of any of my identities. And that authenticity and that authentic inclusion is, is not fully um, seen in a lot of spaces. So, so in in the company that I'm developing um, through workshops and coaching and courses, I'll be working with like individuals and organizations on that concept. 
Yeah, say a little bit more about authentic inclusion, because I, I, I like that, you know, because um, I feel I, I used to be deeply involved in so-called diversity and inclusion work. And um, I always felt and still feel like that most of it is just surface. You yes. know, it's, it doesn't really go deep. And the word authentic, that 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 has a resonance for me. I'm, I'm curious as to what you're sort of what that means for you. So. So, yes. Yeah. So. If you think about it, like you said, like in the diversity inclusion world, we focus a lot on this whole concept of let's make sure that this person is in the room. Let's make sure <laughs> that this person is has, you know, a physical seat, right? The next step is, okay, well, let's make sure that their voice is heard, right? Which is important. And let's make sure that their um, seat at the table and their voice is heard. But let's take this up further. And a lot of people are not always comfortable. They might have a voice and might say something, right? And they might be heard, but they not they, they might not be able to fully voice their true self, right? Because they're afraid. They're afraid of how they're going to be seen. They're afraid of how they're going to be judged. And imagine then how much value we're losing out because people are not fully able to embrace their true voice and their true self and bring that forward. And so the way, one of the ways that we're doing this is we do these uh, discovering the dark workshops where people are blindfolded and they're not blindfolded for simulation of blindness, but they're blindfolded so that they're in a room. They don't know who's around them. They don't know. They can't see people's facial expressions or judgment or body language. Everyone's blindfolded. And it's so powerful to see how people then actually change immediately and transform into more of themselves. And they speak more of their true voice. And I've had like people in high positions and companies saying, I'm more comfortable in this setting saying what I have to say than in wow. a side setting. So imagine how much we're losing out on the true authentic voice of people because of because of assumptions and isms and you know and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Wow, it's beautiful, Sarah. Um I, I love it. I'm mean, anything I can support it. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm there. You know, it's just beautiful, you know. Um I mean, I, I'm not talking about myself, but too much. But I will say that I was, you know, I've, I was involved with a very sort of prestigious diversity organization, and um, I just had to quit. This is not for, not for me, and that's one of the reasons that I started the Sacred Inclusion Network with some other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Sarah, what haven't I asked you that would be useful that you would like to share? Or, you know, um, that we didn't we didn't get into that. Um, you know, anything. I know you're an introvert, but this is, this is an <laughs> opportunity for you to um, say what you're thinking about. I think for me, you know, what's important is that, you know, whether through ETI, whether through this new company, whether, you know, it's, and this is for everyone's point of reflection is that it's a journey. Um, And for me, it's still a journey. I'm still learning. I'm still learning about myself. I'm still learning about my strengths and weaknesses um, in in leading an organization or in, in different things. And I think for me, what's important is that we're able to embrace all who we are, including our flaws and and love them and not be afraid of, because like one of the things that I've been struggling my whole life, I mean, my whole ETI life um, and beforehand is that when people see a, a person that's blind, there's two assumptions attached to my blindness. One, on, on one hand, oh, they're incapable you know, poor you, they're incapable. The other hand is like, oh my God, you're an angel. (laughs) Um, And those two narratives forced me for many years to not want to show, you know, my flaws because, oh, I'm perceived to be an angel or that, or my flaws in in that I can't do certain things. I'm not, I'm I'm a human. There's things I can't do, but I used to always wanted to prove to the people around me that I can and I can do. Um, because I didn't want to see, I didn't want to see, be seen as incapable because then be like, oh, because she's blind, she can't do, right? So there was a lot, like, I put a lot of constraints on myself and how I presented myself because of how blindness was seen, right? And yes, I, I have some kindness in me and I have, I'm a good person, but I'm a human and I have flaws, right? I, so that was a huge struggle for many years to kind of figure that out and, and have people see me for who I am and accept me for who I am. Also, on the other hand, for the longest time after a while, like ETI became my identity and I became ETI's identity. And that was actually one of my decisions to actually say, you know what, I need to step step away because I remember a friend asking me, who are you outside of ETI? And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) And 
But ATI was really important for me in the beginning because ATI was a place of empowerment for me. ATI was a place where I was able to embrace my blindness. So it's beautiful. But almost like I embrace it too much to a point where I'm blind and that's everything. <laughs> and it's because it was for ATI, right? Mm. But then I had to take a step back and say, wait, I'm more than that. So that was, you know, one of the reasons for me to like take this next chapter in my life. Wow. Oh, boy. Well, I mean, I'll say, Sarah, um, you are not just blind or, or just ETI to me. Uh, you're, just, <laughs> you're, just, you're just beautiful, you know. Um, so please take that in. So I'm going to, um, in a moment, I'm going to say formally goodbye to you, but um, I want to just give people some, um, if they want to get more in the Sacred Inclusion Network, I'll tell them just a, just a little bit about them. And um, then we'll say goodbye. Um, those of you listening that want more information about the or get connected to our network. The simplest way, there's two simple ways. One is just check out our website and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, another better way, if you're on Facebook, like so many of us are, just find our um, private Facebook group and um, ask to be invited, I'll let you in. Um, if you really want to do more, um, one way you can do is so you can um, support the podcast and you could find us on Patreon by looking for Sacred Inclusion Network. And for as little as a dollar a day, you can, uh, you know, you can help us buy equipment, all these kind of things. Um, uh, in any event, um, and I will put in the show notes some information about, uh, about Sarah and also about, uh, about the organization. And uh, Sarah, I'm just, um, I'm honored that you spent some time with me and I hope we stay in touch in the future. And, um, you know, I am going to put out an invitation for the ambassador thing. We have these events that we do. Uh, I didn't mention that. On the third Saturday of every month, we have what we call an online community exploration. We have guests. You can look up, look on our website under events, sacredinclusion.com. I think it's events, and you could find out what the next thing is. So anyway, um, Sarah, thank you so very much. And, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, I'm, I, just li- I just like you. You know, it's, it's, it's fun to get to know you a little bit and to, uh, you know, share a little bit of what you're doing. And thanks so much for being my guest. Of course. I was, I was really happy and honored to be with you today. And um, th- thank you for hosting me. And yeah, thank you. <laughs>